Hello, and welcome to the Inside Writing Podcast. I am your host, Josh Sippy. As a reminder, all of these episodes are recorded live Wednesdays, 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern time. You can sign up on the Gotham Writers website for free. Now then, on to the show. Today, we're talking with Chantel V. Johnson. Chantel is a tenant lawyer and writer, a graduate of Stanford Law School and a 2018 Center for Fiction Emerging Writers Fellow. She lives in New York. Her debut novel, Post Traumatic, publishes April 5th, 2022, and is available for pre-order wherever books are sold. Chantel, welcome to the show. Hi, Josh. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So we're going to start where we're starting with all of our conversations this season, which is I want to talk about your breaking in point. So your book comes out in two and a half weeks. Um, I'm, congrats, by the way. But I'm, I'm curious if you feel like you're already part of the writing world or at what point in your writing journey you felt like, OK, I'm here, I'm doing this. Yeah, um, I think that's a really good question. So we were talking a little bit before about how I, I am a lawyer, work full time, do not have a um, an MFA. Um, so I, I decided that I wanted to write a novel about uh, maybe 10 or 12 years ago. Um, I was actually in graduate school at the time. Um, I was getting a PhD in English literature. So though I don't have an MFA, I do have some kind of background like in the literary world in terms of, you know, I was studying to be a literary scholar. Um, I ended up leaving that program after a few years with just a master's. Um, I decided kind of, I decided a couple of things. One, that I didn't want to write about literature, I wanted to create literature. And then secondly, and simultaneously, I had this political awakening that led me to want to really live out my politics in the world. Um, and I ended up going to law school. But the idea was the, the, the very ambitious idea <laughs> was, I'll just be a lawyer and write novels. <laughs> and so, so, so that was the goal. Um, so I, but my, my break-in moment came, we can talk more about my career later, but my break-in moment came um, in around late 2017, early 2018. I, I had been working on my novel, the novel that has become post-traumatic. Um, I had been working on it for a few years and I became obsessed with getting an agent. Um, the obsession was all consuming. I, I decided that I wanted to be published by a, a traditional big five publisher. And to do that, I, I, I felt and I knew that it would be really important for me to have an agent. So the, the goal was become an, get, get an agent within the next year. And I decided that in order to, to do that or to make that process a little bit easier, I needed some kind of, I needed an accolade essentially. I needed, I needed something that I could put on a CV or resume that kind of associated me with the literary world. That was kind of like a shortcut to, oh, she's a lawyer, but she's gotten something so she can write, you know? <laughs> um, so I started researching fellowships and residencies with a kind of lower barrier to entry, uh, because one of the problems when you don't have an MFA is when you when when applications require letters of recommendation letters of reference it can just be harder to get those things and of course i could have gotten them from you know colleagues and a couple of writer friends um but because i didn't have an mfa it just didn't feel so easy to me to ask for people to to recommend me in terms of my writing so I was specifically looking for fellowships and residencies that didn't have that requirement of letters of reference. And a friend of mine had gotten the Center for Fiction Emerging Writers Fellowship several years prior. And so I had always been kind of thinking about that fellowship, having it in mind. Um, and so I ended up applying for it um, in uh, early 2018. Um, and then a few months later, um, in May of 2018, I was sitting in my office um, after court, <laughs> I got an email um, saying, congratulations, you've been awarded a Center for Fiction Emerging Writers Fellowship. And that really was the moment for me when I felt like I, I broke in. Um, and I'm happy to kind of talk specifically with you about what the fellowship did for me. But that was the moment because it was it was external validation from a, a juggernaut in the industry 
um, saying like, hey, you can you can write. And all that I needed to submit for that fellowship was a writing sample and proof that I lived in New York. So it was something that I could do. Like I had been working on my book for a few years. I had a, my first chapter felt like it was re in really good shape. So I submitted that. Um, and I think literally that was it and maybe a resume, but there wasn't any other stuff that I had to do. Um, and so when I got that, that was the beginning of, of everything for me because it was 2018 Center for Fiction Fellowship, 2019 agent, 2020 sold the book. Right. It, it sounds like, and there's so much that I want to revisit, but it, it sounds like, you know, it's funny because you took all of the right steps. If you're like, it's like, you knew I should get some accolades. You knew you should get an agent. Were you self-educated in, in how to get forward in the publishing or how did you, how did you figure out like, cause so many people out there don't know the right way to go about this. And it sounds like you just were checking things off the list. Like this is what's next. Were you somebody who just learned that? I did. I mean, I'm pretty resourceful, but as I was telling you before um, we started, I, I say that I got a podcast MFA. And so I, <laughs> I listened to so many podcasts. I mean, I think as you do when you're trying to break into any industry, I just became completely obsessed with breaking into the publishing industry. And so I, yeah, I just, I listened to a lot of podcasts with writers. I read a lot of like craft and industry books and articles and just, yeah, I was just like, I need an agent, like, and like, this is what I'm going to do. And it really fit my, like the, the type A part of my personality. Um, like a lot of people think that there is this kind of false binary between writer and lawyer, but <laughs> throughout my career, both sides have really, like I have, I'm very strong in both sides. Um, and like left brain, left brain, right brain are both actually very strong in me. I'm probably half and half. So I just like did this like straight A student zeal <laughs> and I approached getting an agent with that level of zeal. So you mentioned talking more about what the fellowship provided for you. If you don't mind going a little more detail about how that changed you as a writer and, and your perspective or just how it really altered your approach to all of this. Yeah. So the fellowship provided so much. I mean, it provided literal fellowship in terms of be, becoming, um, you know, acquainted with eight other writers who all had the fellowship with me. Um, and so starting to develop that circle of writer relationships, which can be very inspiring, um, especially as someone who was working full time and not really around writers and not really in, involved in literary culture at the time because I couldn't be because I was too busy. Um, so that was really great. We had monthly dinners with people in the industry so like agents and editors would come to dinner with us and share insights and all of them were always willing to, you know, like review our pages or, you know, everyone was basically like, send me your book when it's done, you know? So that was like a series of connections that I, I didn't have before. And I wouldn't have had without that fellowship. Um, probably the most important part was that you had the option of working with a freelance editor um, on your manuscript. And I, as part of my, I have to get an agent in a year plan, <laughs> I decided to absolutely take advantage of that. So I ended up working with, and they matched you with someone, you kind of like, you sent them what you want in an editor, and then they matched you with someone in their editorial network. Um, and I ended up being matched with someone who was really perfect for me. Um, her name's Ann Horowitz. She was great. Um, I highly recommend her. Um, and I just, the other thing about me is that I can be kind of shameless and egoless when I really want something. So like I sent her a really messy draft and my question, and, and I sent her a series of questions. I was like, the first question was, is this good enough to get me an agent? Because that's one of the things that you just, you don't know the answer to that question. Like what, at that time, all I wanted was to see, I wanted to see the manuscript that got people agents. 
And I couldn't see that. Like, no one's going to show you that. <laughs> and so I was like, well, I'm going to take advantage and ask Anne because she's a publishing professional. She would know. She'll be able to tell me, is it ready? So that was my first question to her. So I sent her, um, like, the draft of my novel. And then, you know, we basically, like, went back and forth with it a couple of times. Um, and in the same way that you would do with like a beta reader um, or an agent or an editor, we kind of did that process very early on. Um, and it, it, it was so helpful. The primary way that it was helpful was her enthusiasm for the project. Like she was basically like, there's good bones here, keep going. There's all these things wrong with it, but she was so enthusiastic and supportive. Um, and so I just felt like, so at the end of the fellowship, I had a draft that was significantly better than it was when I started. And I was ready to query after I had worked on it a couple of rounds with her. And that's what I did. So then I queried in the summer of 2019. And did the fellowship also provide you with like a game plan to query or was that something that you put together yourself as well? Yeah, yeah. So Anne was also really helpful with that. I mean, she gave me suggestions of agents to, to query, um, but I had also been separately um, researching agents myself. So one of the things that you know people tell you to do is take books that you really like that are in your genre, go to the acknowledgments, see who that writer's agent is, and then start pitching those people. So I did that um, and I work in literary fiction. So I was looking at um, novels um, and novellas that are, you know, similar to mine in tone and sensibility and subject matter. And then looking at who those agents were and I created a, a, an Excel spreadsheet <laughs> of, of agents. I also got the Publishers Marketplace uh, subscription um, which is worth it. You know, it's $25 a month and you can cancel any time. So you could just, you could conceivably just have it for a month and you can research which agents represent which authors you like. Um, and so, because the point was to do targeted submissions. Like, I think that that's very important. You want to be targeting people who you would want to work with and who actually have the same taste and sensibility as you. So it was a mix of, of Anne kind of giving me some insights and then myself doing my own research. And you said, was this the first novel you'd written or had you done other drafts before? This was my first novel that I had written. Yeah. Okay. And, and how long had you been working on it before you got the fellowship? So I started in, um, so when I was in law school, I, the, the best thing that I did for myself in law school was that I, I started a writing group um, with some, some other law students who, who identified as creative people. Um, and there were four of us and we met regularly. Um, and at the time I didn't, you know, I knew that I wanted to write a novel, but I didn't know what it was, but I was kind of just experimenting with short pieces, um, with, with them. Um, but the, the first, the beginnings of the first chapter came to me, I think my third year of law school, which was like 2013. So quite a long time ago. Um, and then I graduated in 2014, um, but didn't really seriously start writing it until around 2015, 2016. Um, so I had like a few years of writing it under my belt before I applied for the fellowship and then another year before I sought an agent. And when, oh, we're rewinding further here, but I want to get back to the agent in a second. But what, you yeah. know, when you first set out to write this novel, because you touched on a little, what were you trying to accomplish here? Like what, what was the story you were trying to tell that you felt, you know, this, this is what it's going to be. This is what my subject, because, you know, the novel, it's a big undertaking. What made you think this is the subject matter for my first novel? Yeah, the, oh, that's such a good question. I mean, I guess I, I feel like I'm someone who responds to, like, I am a writer who is always writing against writing that I that I that I don't like, and I'm writing toward writing that I do like, and then I'm trying to fill in gaps of things that I haven't seen before. 
And none of that is conscious. So I don't want to make it seem like it actually wasn't the type A mode with, with the subject matter. It was, it, it was more just, I don't know, like the novel for me, I think is, is best at representing consciousness. And I was interested in representing a particularly what I call post-traumatic consciousness that I had not seen in fiction before. So I was interested in writing about things like hypervigilance and um, a, a fear of experiencing violence um, as an adult. Um, and I hadn't really seen those kinds of things represented in books before. And I wanted to see, you know, in some ways I was writing against some of the uh, trauma literature and survivor literature that I had grew up grew up with, like *The Bluest Eye* by Toni Morrison was was a monumental, really important book for me when I was a teenager. But that book, um, if you've read it, it begins with after the grammar school primary part. It begins with that line, "Quiet as it's kept." And it's a scene of women gossiping about a young girl in the town who's been impregnated by her father. And it begins, and Toni Morrison says about that book that um, she wanted to write a book about uh, sexual trauma of, of a young girl, um, but she was primarily doing that from the perspective of, of adults who are gossiping about it, whispering about it. Um, and the, the perpetrator of, of the acts. I mean, she, in that book, attempts this amazing uh, attempt at empathizing with, with evil <laughs> in that book. Um, and, but I didn't want to do any of that. I wanted to write a book about um, adult survivors who are talking about what they've experienced themselves. So it's not women gossiping about you know, what's going on in the town. It's survivors themselves kind of gossiping about their own experiences. And so things like humor were really important to me. Like I also wanted to bring humor, um, dark humor at times um, to survivor narratives. I also wanted to show friendship between uh, women who have experienced extreme childhoods and extreme lives. So I had a lot of things that I was kind of like, here are the models of what trauma literature is. And they're all great in certain ways, like Bastard Out of Carolina and all that kind of stuff. But I don't want to do that. And then here are the writers that I really like, like Ben Lerner, super cerebral. Um, <laughs> and like, what if we, what does a survivor narrative look like if it's written by a Black woman who is, in, who is just as cerebral as Ben Lerner? <laughs> Like, so, so long answer to your question, but it was about reject, rejection and, you know, writing towards people that, that, that I liked. Um, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. And I want to, speaking of rejection, we always have to talk about what, what you faced there. Cause again, it sounds like, you know, I know it wasn't as simple as it sounds, but you know, fellowship, boom, next year, agent, boom, next year, yeah. sold a book. What sort of rejection were you facing in here? Both, you know, if you want to touch on your querying process, what the response there was, because, you know, unless you're one of those fortunate people who first person you queried signed, you <laughs> you faced some rejection, I assume. So what, what were you facing and how did you keep going? Yes, yes, I definitely, I faced a lot of rejection. So <laughs> I, you know, I had my, my list of, of agents to query and it was one of those things where I sent um, I also queried everything that I did. I did everything during the summer, which is really funny because publishing is dead during the summer. <laughs> um, but I, I both sought an agent in the summer of 2019 and we sent my book out on submission in the summer of 2020. So just, I don't know. It just happened. That was the timing. It all worked out fine, but there were longer wait times um, in part because it was the summer. So um I, so the Center for Fiction comes back again because the other thing that they did for us is they hosted readings for us, a couple of readings for the fellows. And a lot of people in the industry came um, and there were agents in those audiences. 
And um, for, for each reading, um, I either met agents who came up to me after the reading and were like, hey, you know, here's my card. Um, or they just like slipped their card to, to like someone who worked for the Center for Fiction because like they had to go. And so then like they would be like, oh, here, Chantal, here's some agent cards for you. <laughs> like they had to go, but query, you should query them. Um, so I wasn't totally in the slush pile. The cool thing was that there were a handful of agents that were interested. Um, so I, I queried all of them. And then I added like about 10 other people that I would have loved to, to work with. Um, and then I just waited and I waited and I waited. And after a couple of weeks, I got an offer um, from someone um, and it was, I had queried Susan Gollum, who is the agent for Jonathan Franzen um, and Rachel Kushner. She was one of the people who gave me her card and I was super excited. Oh my God, I would love to work with Susan Gollum. <laughs> yeah, great. So I queried her um, and she passed, but her assistant was starting to take on clients. And she said, you know, Susan, you know, has to pass. It's nothing personal, whatever. But I would love to represent you. And, um, and so that was my first offer. And then, you know, when you get your first offer, you're supposed to tell everyone that you submitted to that you have an offer. Um, and so I did. And then you kind of like give them like a week or two to get back to you. And I did that. And that's when the rejections started coming in. So it was like, they were like, oh, we're so glad that you found someone, you know, and the rejection was either like, I'm not even sure I'm going to have time to get to it. So you should, <laughs> you should go forward. Like, I wish you the best of luck. Or it was like a, just a rejection of just like, it didn't, you know, whatever. I liked it, but I didn't love it. The kind of thing that they, that they tell you. Um, so I ended up getting a lot of rejections after I got my first acceptance, um, and then, um, I had a phone call, uh, with Mariah and I had someone else who was interested, but, uh, the, the person that I ended up going with was just, she got the book like 100%. She totally got it. And her editorial vision for it aligned with mine. And then we were kind of off to the races and we worked on it editorial together, editorially together for like six to eight months. And then we, we sent it out on submission after that. So yeah, it was, it was rejection, but it was, the rejection was kind of softened because the acceptance came first. Sure. Yeah. And you, you know, you mentioned being out on submission and, and all of that fun stuff, which, which is, we're going to get to that in a second, but whenever mm -hmm. you were certain, cause I know for a lot of writers, it feels like getting an agent is kind of like the end goal. Like once you get that, everything, everything is going to be easy from there. Did you, did you have that perspective or did you know that there was still a lot to do after you got an agent? It's so hard to kind of, <laughs> I mean, I think at the time, I think I was just taking things kind of one thing at a time. So it was like, okay, now I have the agent check, you know, and like now we, now we work together to make it as good as possible for submission. Like, I think at every stage, it was just like, it was like breaking up the publishing project process into manageable chunks for me. So like get the accolade, just do, and that, that just requires like a writing sample. So that's manageable. Okay. Like get an agent and it doesn't have to be perfect when you submit to the agent. It just has to be good enough. And then you do that. And like, now it has to be good enough for the editor. <laughs> and so, you know, it wasn't the end. It was a, it was a new beginning. Um, and the editorial process with my agent, like the revision process took a bit longer than, than either of us thought. I mean, I think our initial call, she was like, yeah, it's not going to be much, you know, but I was working full time and, it, and everything just ends up taking a lot longer than you think. Like a revision of an entire book of a 300 page book takes a really long time, you know, even if you're not working and at each goal you know, at each point that I would hit, I would want to be making the book better each time. So there was more pressure each, each time. And then I want to ask, because this is always such an interesting discussion, is since you work full time and you're writing on the side, how mm -hmm. did you balance 
such, you know, how did you manage your time throughout all of that? How did you keep finding time to write? Was it a challenge at times to find time to write? It was, yeah. I mean, challenge is one word. <laughs> it was. At some point I thought that this was just the biggest mistake that I had ever made. Um, and that the cats, the cats are waking up <laughs> and they are, they are speaking. Um, but I, it was really, really challenging. I wrote in the mornings before work. I wrote um, on the subway in the notes app of my phone on the way to court. I wrote in court while I was sitting in court waiting to be called <laughs> to like argue a motion to start a trial. There's lots of downtime in court. Um, court is all about like bureaucratic excess and wasting people's time. So there was, <laughs> there was downtime in court, but I would be on my phone, like having ideas, writing on my phone and then whatever snatches of the day, um, and at night. And I never took real vacations. All of my vacations were staycations where I just worked on the book. And I mean, that was my, that was my life for like four or five years, um, I don't recommend it, but I also don't regret it. So <laughs> I don't know what to say, you know. Um, I, I wouldn't have it any other way. I mean, I do think being a lawyer has actually really changed my writing for the better. So, which, which was my next question, which is, do you feel like you've benefited as a writer keeping that full time job? You think you have? Yeah. I mean, um, I. I think being forced to write in, in little chunks of time makes you a lot less precious. People say this who work full time, people with small children say this, that you just get a lot less precious about, about, you know, you don't need rituals to write because you, you don't have time for rituals. You just have to get it done. So in, 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 in that way, it was really great. And then I actually felt like legal writing helped my fiction writing because legal writing like you have to be very precise and um not really decorative and so there's a you know good legal writing is is very clear and concise and precise um and i think that that really helped me like i don't use a lot of like metaphor and simile and figurative language you know i tend to write in a in a clear-eyed way and you know you, your journey it sounds like you always had this specific vision for your writing for your story you, you know going through the fellowship through getting an agent did your vision for it change at all throughout it were there any parts that you learned later on where you're like yes i'm actually going to adapt that to my vision was it always sort of like you had you knew where this was going to go and just finding people that believed in that vision my vision definitely changed. Um, I think that's a that's a good question and a really important point because, you know, a novel takes a really long time to write, or at least mine did. And I found that my, like, so much of my style is inspired by my reading. And I think this is just advice that I always give to writers who are starting out is just read, read a lot read widely and be, be present and paying attention to what you're responding to both positively and negatively. And I found that my taste changed over the course of my writing of the book. I think when I started writing the book, I, I started writing a book that was way more or way less plotty and there's still, it, it's still not like a huge plotty book, but you know, it, it is a woman thinking for a lot, <laughs> but, but in the beginning it was like all woman thinking. And I love those books, you know, like um, I, I, I love books where it's just like really uh, interesting thoughts and feelings for, you know, 150 pages. Um, but often those are novellas. <laughs> it's, it's hard, it's really hard to carry that over 300 pages. So I started writing a book that was even more um, interior and navel gazing than the ultimate book. And as I kind of evolved, 
I saw that, and part of this was because of, of external input, you know, like the editor that I worked with at Center for Fiction, she was like, can we, could you develop her workplace more? Could you develop her family relationships more? And that inspired me to want to kind of open up the world of the book and to, and to just kind of get creative with how you can use minor characters. Like you can use other characters to advance the larger themes of the book, but I just learned that it's, it's, it's incredibly difficult to carry a 300 to 400 page novel with a single character. And I didn't think that I could do it. I'm glad that I realized that. And that inspired me to, to flesh out um, other characters. And, um, and I think it made it a, a better book. And, you know, we talk about stuff that you adapted. Were there any things, because, you know, as readers when we or writers, when we seek feedback, sometimes you have to filter out what's good feedback and what's not good feedback. I assume there were times where you had to, like, say, you know what, that's not right for me. How do you, how do you determine what is and isn't right to implement to your story? I think I, think I just go by instinct. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, I think some suggestions immediately sound correct. And that's the easiest, right? Because it's just like the editor says it, the agent says it, you agree. Great. There's no problem. The second easiest is when they suggest it and you disagree. Because if I, if I strongly disagree, then I'm not really going to implement the, the change. Now, their, their, their suggestion may be, I may be able to approach it in a different way way. So like sometimes they make a suggestion you're like, well, I don't agree with how you um, are are proposing to solve the problem, but I can solve it in a different way. Um, The hardest for me is when they make a a, a suggestion and I don't know how I feel. (laughs) So I think, I think when you have other readers involved, it's just, you know, and, and that's, that's what takes the longest to kind of sort out, you know, like, does this work and does this not? And, And sometimes you have to implement and like write new scenes and then read it all together and then just kind of decide if, if the work has been made better for it or not. Um, but, but generally it's, it's, it's instinct. Um, sure. for me. And then there was something else you mentioned getting from the fellowship that I wanted to revisit as well. And that was the community aspect of it, which, you know, <laughs> writing is solitary. It's one of the most commonly said things out there. So how did, how did having a community base, help you in your, in your process as a writing journey? How do people find that community for them? Yeah, I mean, so for me, it was, it was, it was so great just talking to other writers and then kind of having to shift. Like I felt during the fellowship that my identity was shifting from a lawyer who like secretly writes sometimes to like, a writer or an author who is now like at dinner with an editor who's asking me like, what's my book about? And like, what's my aesthetic philosophy or or something. So I I was forced to kind of like perform and like to, to perform a writer self, but also to really think about why I'm doing this and be able to articulate it. Um, And that's something that only comes when you're talking to other people about writing. Um, but also like talking to my fellow co-fellows about what they're reading and, and hearing them read and being so inspired by what they're doing and the ways that what they're doing are very different from me. Um, but in, in contemporary times, I've been very lucky that I, um, when I was like I'm, I'm only recently on Twitter now to do like book promotion, <laughs> but for, before that I was just lurking on Twitter and, but I followed a bunch of writers and this writer, Liv Stratman, um, who wrote Cheat Day, uh, a novel that came out last year. Um, last year she posted on Twitter that she was starting a group, like a support group for novelists that were debuting during the pandemic. And I just happened to see the tweet like in my feed um, and I wrote her and she ended up starting an amazing community of like over a hundred debut novelists, people who have debuted um, from 2020 to 2022 and 
particularly for someone who is outside the industry, that group has been just an absolute lifesaver for me. Um, because there's the community that you get in terms of like going to readings and stuff like that. But there's like another community in terms of like sharing resources and like, once you sell your book, like what's the cover process? Like what's the publicity process? Like, like, is this normal? Like being able to kind of talk to other writers about what they're experiencing inside the publishing machine, um, has been, has been really important. And, I guess my recommendation for people is just, I don't know. I feel like a lot of people want community and I feel like if you build it, they will come. Like, I think Liv was just kind of like, I want to do this thing. This is something that I want to do. I feel like this would be helpful for other people. And so she just made a call on Twitter. And I feel like you can do that in whatever town you're in. Like you can start a writing group. You can start a support group for, for, for writers. Like, If you build it, they will come. People want community. Um, And sometimes you might have to be the one who starts it if you want it. So I have a bunch more questions, but I want to get to some audience questions to make sure we have time for them. So first question, how much of your book did you complete before getting an agent? And how did the agent help you get published? Mm. Great question. So I, I had a full draft Um, it was really, you know, by that point, it was really just about kind of tightening things up. Um, but I did have a full draft. I had like, whatever the number of words is like 70 to 80,000 words, um, for a novel. So I had a beginning, middle and end by the time, like I didn't send it out to an agent until I felt that it was as strong as it could be on, on my own. Yeah. And next question. Well, this is not a question, but I'm currently in my undergrad. I'm an aspiring lawyer and a young writer, and I'm just so oh. inspired by your story. Oh, I love that. <laughs> keep on keeping on. <laughs> you can do both. It's hard, but you can do both. Next question. Some famous lawyer authors focus their work on adventures in the legal profession. Do you see your fiction writing heading in that direction, or do you prefer to steer around work-related narratives? I absolutely see my writing heading in that direction. I mean, in my book, um, which I'll just hold up. All this dramatic. Here we go. Um, <laughs> there's a little bit of law in this. I mean, she works in a psychiatric hospital, which I have some experience with. Um, I briefly did an externship at a psychiatric hospital representing people who were trying to get out of the hospital or to not be forcibly medicated. Um, and so my main character is, is a lawyer. Um, but that's not the bulk of the book. Um, but my second book, which I haven't started because I'm too scared, <laughs> but my second book <laughs> is is going to be a workplace novel, and it does take place in a legal nonprofit. Um, so I, I'm very interested in work and the workplace and legal work and lawyers, uh, good lawyers, bad lawyers. Um, so yes, absolutely. It's, it's a big inspiration for me and I'm very much looking forward to turning to it seriously in, in the next book. Next question, simple question enough. If you don't mind sharing, who is your agent? My agent is Stacy Testa from Writer's House. Awesome. And another non-question, but a comment nonetheless, as another black female attorney in NYC, this was so cool. Totally agree with, totally agree about there being a lot of downtime in court. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I love it. all right so keep the questions coming i'm gonna go back to my questions but as soon as i see them i'll get to them as soon as i can uh one thing i wanted to ask you you know especially being that you know you you had set time for writing like you would get up earlier you would find time. what if you just what if writer's block happened what if you just couldn't find the creativity in the moment did you keep writing and try to get through it or did you just say hey not this isn't happening right now Yeah, you know, writer's block is an interesting, it's an interesting topic. It's an interesting, it's an interesting phrase. I try to, when I'm thinking about like, pure, I prefer to refer to those periods as like periods where I'm not writing. (laughs) And because sometimes it's a block, but sometimes it's, it's something else. And I definitely have had those. I mean, I, I would say that I'm in one right now. I am like right now I am not writing, but I don't know that I would call it writer's block. Like right now I'm trying to right now 
I'm, I'm not, I, I'm terrified of starting a new project. Right. So that's that's the precise and more accurate way to describe what I'm experiencing. It's it's not experienced as a block. It's it's the sheer terror of starting something new. And a lot of my block is like the gap between the thing that you want to write and the work that it's going to take to do that. And I am terrified of that work because I've done it with this and I know how much work it takes. And it's like, you know, it's almost like when you get out of a long relationship and you're like, you know, well, if you're practicing self-care and you're not self-sabotaging and you're being, you know, kind of present, you're like, it's too soon to get into a new relationship, you know? And, And that's how I'm feeling right now. But I have had times when I have been like, like with my, with post traumatic you know, there were times where it was like, I'm really stuck. Like, I don't know how to end the book. I don't know how the book should end. And what I do in those points, I mean, like I said, is I, you know, I got a podcast MFA. So I listen to podcasts. I listen to interviews with writers. I, Zadie Smith is a writer who is, there's so many interviews with her. There's so many YouTubes with her. She's on so many podcasts. She always inspires me and she helps break me through whatever block I'm going through. So I think older writers who have like a lot of um, interviews that are available for me, they're like, they're like my remote mentors, (laughs) you know, because they've been through it all, including fallow periods, which is just a part of the writing life. There's going to be times when you are not writing. That's fine. That's, that's part of it. And you have to kind of accept that and just move through it. And sometimes when you're in that, the solution is just read, 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 watch movies, listen to music, do a lot of inputs if you can't do outputs and something will come again. And you just have to have that faith. So I have that faith that like once I'm done promoting the book, you know, hopefully I'll want to write again. Which you've mentioned it twice now, and I, you touched on it quite a bit, but I'm curious where that fear comes from of starting the second project. You, you said it's just knowing all the work that went into this one. So are you like, are you anticipating it's just going to be the same process again? Yeah, I think so. I think, I think it's going to be the same process again. I think it's and the same psychological process of going through the like the perfectionism and self-doubt and fear of failure. And then you're starting and it's not perfect. And you have to produce a less than perfect draft and a less than perfect second draft and a less than perfect third draft. That is a lot of work. And it's a lot of psychological turmoil to put yourself through. And I am not ready for that. <laughs> <laughs> so that brings- and I don't- Yeah, go ahead. No, you, you can finish what you're saying. I was just going to say, like, I think in some ways it gets easier. It's, it's easier in the sense that, that I know that I've done it before. So I, I think that I can do it again, but I just feel like every book is so different. Um, or at least my goal is to kind of to write different books, books that are different from each other. Um, and so it's going to be a whole new challenge. So it's, it's going to be easier in some ways, but more challenging in, in other ways. And that brings up an interesting question, this question of finding validation as a writer. And I find it interesting that, because this is the first, I would think this is the first time I've heard a writer who, do you, I mean, let's frame it this way. Do you feel like, you know, more pressure for the second book than you did for the first one? Mm, I would say it's, yeah, maybe, maybe more pressure um, because I want to do better. Mm. So, yeah, I mean, I think I, I'm someone who's constantly trying to grow and advance. So I would like to feel that I have written a better book than the first mm-hmm. book. Um, but I also recognize that that is a really not fair way <laughs> to be thinking about things, but, but, but it's how I, it's how I think about things. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I think there's more internal pressure. It, it's not so much external um, because I don't even know how the first book is, is going to be received yet. And we have another question from the audience here. How was the advance? Do you feel that your advance was fair? Yeah, I feel that my advance was, was definitely fair. Um, I mean, my book went to auction 
Mm. Um, so that was cool. Um, and, uh, yeah, I got, I got really lucky. I was also, my book was heading to auction. And I didn't know that that's what was happening <laughs> because <laughs> we, we sent out my book, like I said, in the summer of, of 2020 and my agent just started emailing me like, Oh, so-and-so is interested and, sh- and they would like to have a call with you. And so I was doing calls with editors, but in the calls, I mean, no one was offering. They were just telling me everything that they loved about the book and, and, and telling me their editorial vision for the book. And I either kind of agreed or I didn't. Um, but after about like five or six of those calls, I was like, wait, what is happening? And my agent was like, oh, there's going to be an auction. <laughs> that's, that's, what's, that's what all these calls are. So, so yeah, so I ended up um, in an auction and didn't realize it. That's pretty awesome. <laughs> and auctions drive the price up. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Is the oh, we have another question just came in now. Uh, what was your process for your first draft? Did you have an outline? I did not have an outline. I wrote whatever I wanted, whenever I wanted, and it was all in the same word document, and it was an utter mess. And then I made sense of it later. And I don't recommend it, but that's probably what I'm going to do for the second book. <laughs> As well. <laughs> that is my favorite writing process. And I'm so glad there are other people out there that do it. <laughs> yeah, it's just, a, just an utter disaster. Utter um, yeah. Is there anything that you've learned now that you wish you would have known earlier as a writer? Any, any sort of lessons that you wish you could impart on a younger version of you? Um, I mean, everything is subject to change. So agonizing over little things doesn't really make that much sense if, if, if that, if that resonates, Mm -hmm. um, you know, you're going to have so much editorial input from others, um, that sometimes, you know, it's just important to kind of be like a shark in the water and maintaining momentum and moving forward, um, and not getting caught up in, in small details, because you're going to be, if, at least if you're writing a novel, you're probably going to be working on it and editing it over several drafts for, for many, many years. So just be less precious. And then where do you go for inspiration? Like, if you know, you really want to write and you, you know, I know we've talked about sort of priming yourself and like getting in the right mode to write, but I'm sure there are things that inspire you more than others to write. Like, is it television? Is it reading other stuff? I assume where, where do you find your inspiration? Yeah, definitely um, other books, um, both good and bad. Um, Like I said, you know, I'm someone who writes against and I write toward. (laughs) Um, So things that I love and things that I hate. Um, I mean, with Post Traumatic, for instance, I had such a a wide array of of influences. Like one of my early influences was the stand-up comedian Maria Bamford, um, who does comedy about, uh, her mental health struggles with anxiety and OCD. Um, and she does that all while doing a lot of different voices. Um, you know, she does like the voices of her parents and the voices of her therapists. Um, and she was one of the first people who showed me that you could, you could take a lot of stuff that I was interested in, like, like therapy and mental health stuff and you could just turn it into comedy. Um, and in some ways my book wouldn't exist with, without her. Um, uh, and I'm inspired by music a lot. Um, and that's something that gets hard to explain, but when I, the way that I think about my book in terms of the structure, um, I think about the chapters as songs on an album. So, you know, each song might be very different in, in, in sound and in tone and in production, but they're all united, you know, by a common, you know, by the fact that they're all produced by the same artist, you know, and, uh, and so my, my chapters have chapter titles the same way that, that songs and an album do. And my chapters, like some, sometimes the writing style is different. From, from chapter to chapter, just like a song. You know, some songs are really wordy and some songs are less wordy. Um, and so music is a, is a huge influence for me. There's also a lot of music in the book. There's a lot of music references in the book. The main character loves music and she, 
talks about it a lot. And then last thing I want to ask before we get into, you know, where people can find you and promotion and all that stuff. Um, you know, for writers, it's so hard to sort of trust ourselves and trust that we are good writers. Was there any moment in your writing journey where you were like, you know what, I, I do know what I'm doing. I did where you started to trust yourself that you knew how to write and that you were actually a good writer. Yeah. I mean, I'm actually someone who that wasn't exactly my issue. Like I, and, and, and everyone's different and I do want to honor that, but I am someone who I knew that I was talented, but what I realized was that talent is not enough. So, you know, I've always been a hyperverbal person and, you know, I have like a literature PhD kind of background, you know, and, I, and, and, and as a lawyer, you're using words a lot to persuade um, and so it wasn't a question of whether I was a good writer or not, because I, I, I've had that ever since I was young, but that is very different from being able to execute a full novel or being able to write a short story that's really resonant, you know? So I guess for me, it was a different kind of question. It was about kind of realizing that talent isn't enough, that actually you, you do kind of need to learn the craft of, of writing and what is going to sustain someone's attention for several hundred pages. And those can be separate things. And I mean, and so talent was not enough for me. And so I think that there are some people who have that natural talent, but that's not enough. And I think the flip side of that is that you can become a better writer. Like if you don't see, if you don't think that you have that like automatic natural talent, you actually really can learn that. Um, if you dedicate yourself to reading as much as possible, because for me, it's just, it's all about the reading. I think that what you, what you take in um, then comes out. I think one more question in here from the audience, because it's a good question. Yeah. How do you envision the career balancing priorities you may face, such as becoming a senior partner, continuing your writing, advising in the movie versions of your books, problems of success? Oh, wow. I love this question. <laughs> um, so I ended up, um, I left my job recently. Um, and so I am now writing full time. Um, and that, so that's, that's a cool kind of phase in my career that I, that I had been really working towards. Um, mm -hmm. and so I'm happy to kind of be there. Um, so, so that's great. Um, I do really miss lawyering. And so I have thought about, you know, I think after book promotion is over, um, thinking about kind of if and when and how I'm going to re-enter the workforce, um, you know, it may just be that all my lawyering energy goes into my second book, but, you know, it also may be that I end up lawyering part-time or, or something like that because I do miss advocacy. Um, and then in terms of success, I mean, I'll say that I'm a pretty high bandwidth person and I like to be doing a lot of things. And I think that, um, Quitting my job was great in a lot of ways, but I really miss working. So I'm actually, I'm going to have to start working at some point. Otherwise I'm going to go a bit cuckoo. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and then if a question we always, we always try to end with, if you could give one piece of advice to people that want to follow in your footsteps and, and do what you've done, what would that piece of advice be? Oh, wow. I mean, I guess I've said to read widely. I've said that multiple times. Um, so I, you know, um, and then I guess, I mean, I've also said this, but I do just think that if you can, if you can break up the publishing process into manageable chunks for yourself, um, it can make things feel more achievable. Um, and so whatever your goal is, you know, let's say your goal is I want to write like a short story and get it in XYZ magazine or whatever, like, well, maybe you're starting small with, with that and building up to that goal, right? Like maybe you start with, I'm going to read a bunch of short stories to kind of understand what makes a good short story, you know? 
Um, and then I'm going to come up with a synopsis and then I'm going to write like a really good intro paragraph. Like I think just breaking things up into chunks has kind of been how I've made the process more manageable. And I recommend doing that. And then last but not least, your time to promote uh, where can people find you? Uh, tell us about the book release, anything you want to throw out there. Yeah. So my book, um, Post Traumatic, um, comes out on April 5th. Um, I know that um, Josh in emails to y'all is going to post a link where you can buy the book. Um, I also tweet uh, sometimes updates about the book. I'm Chantal B. Johnson on Twitter. So you can find me there. Um, and my book launch is going to be, uh, both in person and virtual, um, on books are magic. Uh, I'm launching the book with Liv Stratman, um, who I mentioned before. She's really great. I also have events with, um, Tori Peters, um, who wrote Detransition Baby, which was really great. That event is on April. So my launch is April 7th with books are magic. You can Google books are magic, John Talby Johnson. I'll also be posting the link on my Twitter. And then on April 14th, I'll be in conversation with Tori Peters at the Center for Fiction, um, which is also going to be on Zoom. So folks all over the country can see that. Um, and yeah, so you can catch me on Twitter. Um, and I know Josh will post links to the book. There's also a Goodreads giveaway happening of the book right now, um, which I can send Josh. I think I can also, maybe I can drop it into the chat too. So I feel like I... Um, I copied it before. Um, so if you want, but if you want to try to, yeah, I'm going to put it there. If you want to try to enter to win a hardcover, um, the giveaway runs for the next few days. Awesome. Chantel, thank you so much for coming on the show. This was great. Awesome. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks everyone for all the great questions. You were all great. <laughs> So to everybody, <laughs> thank you. Thank you for being here. We're going to be back next week talking to Ryan McKinney. Same, same time, same place. Thank you all for being here and we'll see you next time. Bye.